So, um, good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, um, this is the third lecture of the day, and today we have here, uh, it's our great honor to have Professor Kun Yang uh, as our third speaker of today's lecture. Um, Professor Yang got his PhD from Indiana University, and then he did a postdoc at Princeton and at Caltech. Now he's a professor at uh, Florida State University. His research interests include uh, phone call, fractional phone call system, conventional superconductors, and <coughs> sort of phone magnets. And he has a great book on modern condensed physics, which I find very helpful. And let's welcome you. Um, thank you very much, uh, the organizers, for inviting me to this great uh, school. Uh, as I already mentioned, I was actually a uh, postdoc here many, many years ago, so many years ago that when I was here, this building actually didn't even exist. <laughs> um, well, since then, uh, uh, Princeton has been the favorite place for me to come visit, actually, before pandemic. I used to come once every year, sometimes more often, but I haven't been back since the pandemic, so it's a great uh, 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 pleasure to be back and uh, share with uh, some of our uh, work that's actually either done directly in collaboration with people here or closely related to work done right here. Um, so uh, this is, I guess, the second lecture that's uh, on a fractional quantum Hall effect. I understand that uh, Mike Manfred gave uh, his first talk yesterday, uh, which he must have given a, a very uh, uh, comprehensive uh, introduction already. But just for the sake of uh, completeness or being self-contained, I will uh, still start from the very beginning, uh, which is uh, uh, this plot. So this is uh, probably the most important, or at least the most unusual set of experimental data in the history of science because it actually contains two Nobel Prizes in it. Uh, one, of course, is the uh, integer quantum pulse sequence labeled y by one, two, three, four, et cetera. But then there is actually an even richer set of uh, uh, sequence that uh, labeled by some um, uh, fractional, rational fractional number, uh, most prominent uh, being uh, one third, uh, first discovered by uh, uh, Dan Sui and uh, Paul Stormer, Dan was of course a faculty here, uh, whose office is right next building until his retirement. And of course the two Nobel Prizes that uh, I was alluding to uh, was the one given to uh, first to Wang Kriching, I guess five years after his discovery of the integer, in fact, and then uh, in 99, uh, 1998, uh, to both the experimental uh, list and the theorist uh, Laughlin for the discovery and the uh, uh, theory for the quantum quantum Hall effect. Now, I understand this is mostly a uh, 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 mathematical audience, but if I were giving a colloquium to a broad uh, 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 audience, then I will find it very difficult uh, to justify uh, talking about question of quantum Hall effect after, I don't know, 25, uh, 30 years, uh, even more. Uh, actually, the situation is actually even worse than this because in my way of counting, there are two more Nobel Prizes that are directly related to quantum Hall effect. Uh, one, of course, is the uh, uh, 2010 uh, Nobel Prize for uh, graphene. Uh, well, the reason they got the Nobel Prize is because they discovered uh, Dirac massless Dirac electrons in graphene. <laughs> but the reason we know, or the way they convinced these are indeed uh, Dirac electrons, is actually through this unusual sequence of uh, quantum Hall plateau, it's actually integer quantum Hall plateau, which are quantized, not at integers, but actually at half integers. Of course, there's a little bit of cheating here. Uh, the appropriate unit is not E square of H, but four E square of H. The factor of four comes from the double spin degeneracy and the double valley degeneracy, but once you exclude that fourfold degeneracy, you find that uh, the quantization is actually not an integer, but actually a half integer. And that, of course, is because there is a pi barrier phase when a Dirac electron actually moves around the circle, and this pi barrier phase gives this one half uh, phase shift resulting in this uh, somewhat uh, unusual anomalous integer quantum Hall sequence. And the next one, which happens to be the, well, at least until now, the most recent condensed matter Nobel Prize, uh, which is uh, 2016, um, uh, shared uh, uh, by Solis, Helden, and uh, Kostolitz. Uh, 
And uh, I guess the, the, uh, it's a combination of classical and quantum topology in uh, static and condensed matter physics. Um, basically, uh, Solis pointed out early on uh, in this business that uh, the uh, uh, origin of the quantization of Hall conductance is actually uh, topological. Basically, the Hall conductance is a measure of a, a topological uh, a quantum number. Um, since then, uh, especially thanks to the work of many, many people, in particular Xiao Gang, uh, the uh, notion of topology uh, has become more and more uh, popular, not only in condensed matter physics, but actually uh, in all branches of physics, uh, to a point that uh, relatively recently, a non-condensed matter colleague of mine summarized all the condensed matter colloquia he heard in recent years as just one equivalence class, which is donut is the same as a coffee cup. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. If it's a bad thing, I would blame Xiaogang for that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but, uh, but, but the point uh, of, of today's, uh, well, for this uh, uh, lecture is that actually I will, I will try to convince you that there is actually a life uh, beyond the topology uh, in uh, uh, condensed matter physics and actually in physics in general. Uh, there's not only very important and interesting topological physics, but also, which of course, uh, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, uh, the origin uh, of the universality of the whole conductance, but there's actually also very interesting uh, non-universal physics uh, in uh, fractional quantum particle liquids. <coughs> and to me, this is actually first uh, explicitly uh, emphasized by a uh, paper by, by, by Duncan, uh, uh, right here, uh, where he pointed out that uh, some of these non-universal physics is actually associated not just with topology, but in particular uh, with geometry. So, um, well, I understand this is, a, this is a school. This is not a, 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 a seminar or anything. So I'm going to go back to some fairly old work. So I'm going to actually review some, something that I did uh, almost exactly 10 years ago which actually tries to uh, make a connection between this uh, uh, theoretical notion of the geometry uh, in uh, uh, quantum core liquids, fractional quantum liquids, to actually experiment. And uh, uh, by presenting a, uh, I guess, in uh, uh, Eduardo's uh, classification scheme, an exact result, although I'm not sure it's actually rigorous. And <laughs> you will tell me <laughs> which way, if, if you Sorry, that it. was not like this. <laughs> OK, well, we're going to see. Okay. So, so the, the point, of course, is that uh, this uh, geometry is not only a, a theoretical construction, it's actually a real thing, which can be seen explicitly right in front of your eyes uh, by making some measurements. Um, Turns out this uh, uh, geometry or geometrical degree of freedom not only exists, it also has very unusual uh, quantum dynamics. And as pointed out by various people, including Duncan and uh, uh, Dan Song, uh, its dynamics, quantum dynamics, gives rise to a very unusual uh, excitation, which actually has spin two. And by making analogy with quantum gravity or whatever uh, quantum theory of uh, uh, gravity that will eventually become, uh, these excitations are named uh, gravitons. So I'm going to, uh, well, I guess that's the main uh, uh, part of uh, this lecture, uh, try to convince you that there is actually, uh, actually there are multiple ways to excite this graviton and uh, prove its uh, uh, unusual uh, uh, properties. Uh, the first is to use- You go uh, to LIGO? What? You go to LIGO? <laughs> <laughs> we don't. We only need to go to Mansell Sheridan's uh, lab. We can actually, we can actually uh, 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 create some well, analog of gravitational waves to, um, to uh, 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 which plays a role like gravitational waves to excite them, or better yet, go to any optics lab to use photons to actually uh, excite these gravitons. And using photons, you can actually even uh, probe a very important uh, a property of these gravitons, namely their chirality. And uh, at the end of the day, we are going to actually come back to topology. So I guess uh, uh, the uh, most important, uh, well, certainly most interesting at the moment, uh, fractional quantum liquid whose topological order is not yet pinned down is this five half state. And we're going to argue that by measuring the graviton chirality of this particular state, you may be able to pin down its uh, topological order. So we sort of come full cycle that uh, geometry in the end will actually inform us about uh, uh, 
topology. So, okay, so uh, again, starting from the uh, very beginning. So, uh, well, turns out the physics of the integer sequence is uh, uh, relatively trivial, I, I guess, in retrospect, which you can actually almost understand without even doing full fledged quantum mechanics, just to do some uh, semi classical uh, electron dynamics in the magnetic field, which we know that, well, they don't do much, they just run around circles, okay? These are uh, just the cyclotron orbits. <laughs> well, uh, these electrons actually don't go anywhere. So uh, how come that uh, uh, you can actually uh, have, uh, have uh, a transport uh, to, to begin with and actually even uh, quantized uh, transport with actually almost no dissipation? Well, the, the reason for that is, well, although these bulk electrons don't seem to contribute to uh, uh, transport, the edge electrons do. So, Let's say if you look at the right edge, well, these electrons are trying to complete the cyclotron circle, just like the bulk electrons. But before they can actually complete such a circle, they would actually run into the wall and bounce back. But then they will try to do the same thing again and again during these uh, skipped cyclotron orbits. They find you find that they actually move from down to up. Well, on the left hand side, the electrons try to do the same thing, but then it actually results in upward motion. So just by actually using this purely classical picture and combine that with some uh, semi-classical quantization rule, like for example, you only allow the cyclotron orbits that uh, um, enclose a, a integer uh, number of flux quanta, you can actually uh, calculate the current carrying uh, ability of these edge electrons. And you find that this would actually give rise to the quantized or transport. And because of the fact that the upper movers and the down movers are actually separated spatially, you cannot actually um, have backscattering, and that's actually the origin of the dissipationless transport, which is uh, uh, shown in the previous uh, experimental data, where the Rxx is actually going to zero when Rxy is actually quantized. So, Xiaodan uh, would like to uh, describe this kind of uh, uh, pattern or um, this kind of topological order, if you wish, using uh, some kind of a dancing pattern. So uh, the uh, uh, dancing pattern for these electrons is actually very simple. Basically, every electron is just doing his or her own dancing, subject to, of course, two constraints. One is this quantization rule that I just mentioned. You have to enclose exactly uh, one flux quantum, I guess, at least in the lowest lambda level, that's the case. And the other is the Pauli principle Namely, each electron has his or her own orbital, but it cannot actually dance into the other or neighboring electron's orbital. So that's actually the simplest way <coughs> to describe the uh, topological order of the integer quantum hall uh, states. Now, the functional quantum hall is much more interesting, which is uh, uh, what we are going to be focusing on. So let's start with the one third, which is the simplest among them. So the filling factor has decreased from one to one third, which means the electrons have more room to dance around. So they will actually indeed dance around. So that's more like a liquid, while this is actually more like a, a insulator, band insulator. So there, of course, in addition to the Pauli principle, you also need to watch out for the Coulomb repulsion. So the rule here is that, well, when two electrons start to approach each other, you want to actually stay away. And the specific way you stay away from each other is when you are getting close to one of the existing electrons, the second electron has to dance around her with a loop that encloses three uh, flux points. Okay, so that's the rule. So just by applying this rule, you can actually, of course, very pictorially understand why you can have fractionally charged for the particles. So let's uh, assume that uh, there is actually a, a pillar in your dancing floor. And obviously, <laughs> you don't want to dance into the pillar. You don't want to collide with the pillar. So what do you do when you approach the pillar? Well, you dance around it. But the quantization rule for the single particle physics tells you that you have to actually dance around this pillar in a loop that encloses one flux quantum. Okay? So this is an additional constraint which can be viewed as a uh, topological defect in the, in the laughing dancing pattern, okay? So obviously, some electron charge is actually depleted 
uh, near this pillar, okay? How much charge is depleted? Well, let's compare that with one electron. As I said, if you have an electron here, all other electrons have to dance around her with a circle that includes three flux quanta, but here you only need to enclose one. So therefore the amount of charge that's actually depleted is precisely one third of that of electron. And that therefore corresponds to a one third charge for the whole, okay? So that actually already in a pictorial way explains that you can have fractionally charged for the particle as a topological defect in the, uh, in the uh, uh, topological dancing pattern. And well, if you really want to stretch this, you can probably come up with some argument why it has fractional statistics, but of course, we're going to just believe the experimentalists and, <laughs> and measure it. And uh, that's what we're going to hear, I guess, uh, uh, later today, if not already. Okay, so, so just to summarize, well, okay, not quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> Commercial break, okay. <laughs> So another way to actually view the uh, uh, view the uh, laughing dancing pattern is actually this this picture, which we we chose to uh, to use as uh, as uh, our reason. Well, not that reason anymore. Our uh, 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 book uh, published four years ago now. Uh, there are different ways to actually interpret this picture. Uh, so the way that I think is more relevant to something I'm I'm going to say uh, uh, later is you view this ball as an electron, and view the three arrows as three flux quanta. So the Laughlin state can be viewed or understood as a way that you actually combine the electron with three flux quanta, that's actually assigned it at least in average, as a composite object, which happens to be a boson and the bosons condense and that gives rise to the, uh, to the uh, 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 fractional quantum hole effect. Uh, so it was published four years ago and uh, uh, since then, uh, widely adopted by many places, including uh, Princeton, actually. I think Shivaji was probably one of the first to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, adopt it here. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's a commercial break, and <laughs> let's get back to the more serious business. So let's summarize the uh, dancing patterns a little bit. So as I said, um, the uh, uh, integer dancing pattern is very simple. Uh, the laughing dancing pattern is uh, uh, much more interesting, and it gives rise to fascinating things like fractional charge for the particles and fractional statistics. And even more exotic, we can even think about a dancing pattern, I guess first uh, 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 discussed by Moore and Reed, which is the following. So in the Moore Reed dancing pattern, you allow two electrons to get as close as the Pauli principle would allow you, okay? So these, these two guys can do whatever they want, basically, as long as uh, uh, they don't violate the uh, Pauli principle, however, when this couple is close together and doing their intimate things, all other electrons need to be uh, 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 as far as, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, possible, which I think is a good thing to do even sociologically. More, more, more precisely, a third electron has to actually be in some sense four steps away. So they have to dance around this couple uh, in, a, in a loop that encloses um, four uh, plus one. So, so basically, uh, you can capture, can capture these uh, uh, topological order using these uh, dancing patterns. But what about the geometry? Well, so uh, well, in, in my way of understanding it, uh, Duncan emphasized that, well, although coming back to the laughing dancing pattern, you have to dance around an existing dancer in the loop that encloses three plus quanta, there's nothing that tells you that that loop has to be exactly circular. It could, for, for example, be distorted in such a way that it's actually elongated along the x direction, but because the uh, uh, amount of flux and therefore its area uh, has to be, uh, has to be <coughs> just, that's a topological constraint, it has to be actually uh, uh, squeezed along the, along the uh, y direction, okay? So you can distort the uh, uh, shape of the uh, dancing pattern, but there is some area constraint that you have to uh, you have to uh, 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 still satisfy. So Duncan uh, uh, calls this uh, area preserving uh, diffeomorphism. So one immediate consequence of uh, the uh, existence of this geometry or, or this geometrical degree of freedom is that unlike to what you have probably heard that the uh, Laughlin state or the Laughlin wave function is actually such a unique or unusual uh, variational wave function that actually does not even have a uh, uh, variational uh, parameter, there is actually a hidden 
uh, very strong parameter in it, which is this geometry or this uh, uh, anisotropy. So we actually uh, explicitly constructed uh, constructed this uh, whole family of uh, uh, Laughlin states uh, in which the original Laughlin wave function is a very unusual member that's completely isotropic, which uh, is uh, represented by this plot. This is a um, color plot of the uh, uh, correlation, uh, correlation function. So it has a, a circular correlation hole, but it can actually distort the uh, uh, Laughlin state to actually make the uh, correlation function actually anisotropic. Now you might ask, well, why, why do you even want to do that? Okay, because uh, the Laughlin, original Laughlin wave function does such a great job. Well, there are at least two reasons why you might want to actually distort this. One is that somehow if in your crystal, you have an anisotropic uh, dielectric constant, then the cooling interaction could be, for example, stronger along the X direction than the Y direction. So then you want to stay away further along the X direction, but then of course, uh, because of this uh, uh, area uh, uh, conservation, you would actually sacrifice the correlation along the y direction a little bit. Now, another uh, uh, situation in which you might want to actually prefer this than the isotropic one is somehow in your electron band structure, you already have some anisotropy. So the natural dancing pattern at the single particle level may already be anisotropic, and then that would actually spill into the, uh, um, into the, uh, uh, two-body correlation as well. And that is actually something that's particularly relevant to what I'm going to discuss a little bit later. So, but the problem is that um, if you look at the original data, the transport data, there's no way for you to distinguish which one of these two locked-in states is actually realized in this particular sample. Because all that you see is a quantized for conductance <laughs> and vanishing longitudinal or uh, uh, dissipative conductance. These are topological, so that gets actually in the way of actually probing this geometry. So in a way, topology is a bad thing because it hides a lot of details which may be of interest. Sorry. Yeah. There's an experiment by J. Mises by the seven thirds. Yes. Where he actually sees a temperature and uh, yeah. dependence and anisotropy. Exactly. But there it's clearly a correlation equation. Exactly. So, so, so in a way, this actually is echoing what I just said, which is once you go to finite temperature, which, which of course you are always up, you are already introducing these topological defects. So the state is not topological anymore. Mm -hmm. so, so strictly speaking, uh, this exact quantization and this dissipationlessness is only true only at zero temperature. And at finite temperature, some of these anisotropy would actually show up, and indeed, uh, it does show up. And I'm going to actually even, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, so the question therefore is, uh, how do you actually reveal this geometry, which seems to be hidden behind these topological properties? So you notice that uh, if you follow this uh, sequence of uh, uh, quantum plateaus from both I say one third, two fifths, et cetera, et cetera, or from the other end, two thirds, et cetera, it actually ends at one half finning. But at one half, you actually don't have a quantized plateau. So this is actually a compressible state. Now, in certain uh, 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 sort of schemes, uh, you can actually view this one half state as a parent state of the neighboring on whole states. And if that is the case, and if you have this geometry or geometrical uh, property of a degree of freedom in these functional quantum hole liquids, it should also be present in this parent state. But there is no topology there, and therefore there is a chance that you can actually reveal this geometry by inspecting this one half state. And that is indeed uh, what I'm going to actually propose. So turns out, uh, at about the same time, I guess shortly after uh, Duncan's uh, uh, original paper, uh, Mansour Shagan's group has actually been um, exploring the geometry of the one half state, and in particular, the uh, uh, shape or anisotropy of the uh, uh, composite fermion from the surface. So the reason I was uh, interpreting the cover of our book as a composite boson is at one half, 
you only have two flux quanta per electron. And if you do the same manipulation, you would actually form a composite object, which is made of an electron and two flux quanta. But when you have two flux quanta, when you exchange them, it gives rise to a two pi very phase. So it doesn't change the uh, statistics. So this composite object is a, 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 a whole, uh, is a fermion, so it's called composite fermion. And uh, well, because you have actually lumped all the flux into the electrons, there is no background flux left, and they should actually form a, a, a Fermi seed like state. And indeed, uh, in the early 90s, uh, there were a lot of experiments uh, demonstrating the existence of these uh, composite fermion Fermi C uh, and Fermi surface in particular um, uh, at half A. So if you have isotropy to begin with, the electron Fermi surface will be circular, a zero field. And just by symmetry, you expect a circular Fermi surface for the composite <coughs> fermion when you turn on magnetic field to put the system at one half field. What Menzel's group, again, by next building, asked back then was a very interesting question. What if your electron Fermi surface is anisotropic to begin with due to, let's say, band structure effect? What happens to the composite fermion Fermi surface? So, um, well, there are two different ways to uh, control the uh, electron uh, Fermi surface and isotropy. One is to actually apply an in-plane magnetic field, which breaks the rotation symmetry. Now, usually, you apply an in-plane field to uh, control the Zeeman splitting. But because of the finite thickness of the uh, 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 to the electron gas layer, there is actually an orbital effect, which gives rise to a uh, anisotropic uh, electron dispersion through this uh, um, in, uh, effective mass tensor, which is rank two tensor. And I uh, deliberately write this as a, uh, some kind of uh, metric tensor, Jimmy and you. And actually it will indeed play a role somewhat similar to a metric tensor. And another way is to actually uh, just add string to explicitly distort the uh, lattice. And that will also um, control the uh, uh, anisotropy in the electron dispersion. So, um, well, just very briefly, uh, the way to measure the Fermi surface and its anisotropy is through this uh, sort of geometrical resonance. Basically, you add some gratings uh, to your sample. And when you are at half filling, uh, the composite fermions see zero uh, net magnetic field. But if you go away from it, it actually gives rise to some composite fermion, sarcogen orbits, which would be anisotropic if the effective mass uh, of the composite fermions is anisotropic and they would actually fit into these gradings and give rise to some resonance signals that can tell you what the uh, uh, Fermi wave vector is along different directions. So not surprisingly, uh, they found that if the electron Fermi surface is anisotropic, so is the composite fermion uh, Fermi surface. Okay, that's not surprising. Basically, <laughs> once you've broken the uh, rotation symmetry, uh, there's no reason to expect a uh, isotropic uh, composite fermion Fermi surface. But somewhat surprisingly, and quite surprisingly maybe at the time, they found that they don't have the same anisotropy. And the uh, uh, composite fermion Fermi surface anisotropy is always less and often much less than that of the electron. So that is actually different from the sort of zeroth order expectation you would have by applying the helpling Lee type of uh, uh, mean field theory, where you just spread out the uh, uh, flux carried by the, um, the commodity fermions to cancel that thermal magnetic field, which would give you exactly the same effective mass as the electron. And people did predict that uh, you should have the same anisotropy for the composite fermion and for the electron. But that's actually not uh, what was found in, uh, in Shagan's uh, experiments. So, uh, so what I'm going to claim through a, what I would call exact, uh, 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 soluble model on the next slide is that actually, first of all, this composite fermion Fermi surface is an exact reflection of Cardan's geometry. And this gives us another perspective to uh, this uh, area preserving diffeomorphism because when we talk about Fermi surface, we have something much more familiar in condensed matter physics known as Ludinger's theorem, which says the Fermi surface can actually change its shape but it cannot change its volume, which is the area in two dimensions. So, so in, in a way, uh, 
Langmuir theorem is a uh, area preserving diffeomorphism in momentum space. But how do you actually connect that with the uh, area preserving, preserving diffeomorphism Duncan talked about, which is in real space? Well, that's because in the magnetic field, there's actually some kind of duality. Well, that's only a pictorial way to, to say this. There's a duality between real space and the momentum space in the magnetic field. So the simplest way to understand that is just to solve the lambda level problem using the lambda gauge, which allows you to choose a momentum, let's say, along the y direction for your lambda level wave function. But you know the lambda level wave function momentum along the y direction tells you the guiding center position along the x direction. So basically, the momentum space and the real space are related by a 90 degree rotation. Yeah, sir. I don't need to be uh, specific. Uh, uh -huh. But I will be. OK. <laughs> I, I know you will be, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so, is it crucial to you that the actual statement of the theorem is the integral in momentum space where the real part of the Greek function is positive? So that's different from that statement. Okay, I, I'm not sure I understand the comment or, or, or question. Could, could you elaborate on that a little bit? The modern term is about a singularity of log t. Ah! So it includes stuff that is in the Fermi liquid and stuff that's not in the Fermi liquid. Right, so, okay, so, so in talking about Fermi surface, I'm not necessarily implying you have a Fermi liquid. So the Lundgren's theorem, I think, right. is more robust than, than the Fermi liquid. Well, so, if, so the actual statement. Yeah. Is, look at the locus of points where real t is positive. Mm -hmm. and real, there are two things that contribute to real t being positive. Mm -hmm. Zeros and volts. Mm -hmm. Any Fermi surface is described entirely by volts. Okay. Not zeros. Right, okay, so, so if you wish, that's the underlying assumption, but I'm not assuming a Fermi liquid. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Okay, so you're only assuming a Fermi Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. But, but that is what gives rise to singularity, which presumably experimentalists can, can measure. Right, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, okay, so, so here comes this uh, exactly solvable model, which uh, tries to relate the, uh, 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 electron anisotropy with the composite Fermi anisotropy, which in turn then relates to the anisotropy of Laughlin or any other uh, fractional quantum polycles. So when we actually uh, look at electrons moving in the high magnetic field, we usually take the high field or high lambda level spacing limit that neglects all the higher lambda levels. And therefore, kinetic energy is a, is a constant, let's say that of the lowest lambda level. And all what we need to worry about is the two-body interaction. Now, sometimes we even think about three-body interaction, but let's do two-body interaction for the time being. So normally you would say, well, quantum mechanics is hard because I have interaction and the kinetic energy that don't commute with each other. And if you are given a problem that you only need to take into account the interaction, you say, aha, it must be Christmas, right? Because, uh, because uh, 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 there is no non-commuting variables. Well, of course, there is no free lunch, other than the one that we just had, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> because when you deal with lambda levels, you have to project the interaction into a particular lambda level, usually the lowest lambda level. And in doing that, you have to replace the electron coordinate by its guiding center coordinate. And the lambda level information is actually encoded in the form factor of the lambda level. Usually we look at the zero lambda level, in which case it is Gaussian. And that is basically just reflecting the fact that the lowest lambda level wave functions are Gaussian wave functions. And the anisotropy in the electron uh, effective mass is actually encoded in the uh, anisotropy of this uh, Gaussian form factor. Okay? And the reason there is no free lunch is because the different components of the guiding center coordinates don't commute. So you are still dealing with a very hard problem. And uh, very often, it can only be solved uh, on a computer with actually relatively few electrons. OK. So now, let's actually consider a very special two-body interaction, which is a Gaussian interaction. So the 
Nice thing about the Gaussian interaction is that when you go to the momentum space, its Fourier transform is also a Gaussian. And here I assume that I have an isotropic Gaussian. So now what I need to do is to combine this isotropic Gaussian interaction with the anisotropic Gaussian low standard level form factor. So the product of Gaussian with another Gaussian is still Gaussian. And I'm combining something isotropic with something anisotropic. So the result in the Gaussian has an anisotropy somewhere between one and the original anisotropy. And that's this G for geometry, uh, which actually involves the ratio between the range of the Gaussian interaction and the magnetic lens, which is the only other, uh, which is the only other uh, uh, lens scale. And this uh, final <laughs> anisotropy is always less than the original anisotropy in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, electron uh, effective mass anisotropy. So that actually is the reason why you actually always end up having less anisotropy uh, when you turn on the magnetic field to go to half filling uh, <laughs> compared to the zero field anisotropy. Now, at this point, I'm only talking about the anisotropy of the Hamiltonian. I haven't told you how many electrons I have yet. So of course, if I actually put the electron the half filling, I expect a, a, a Fermi C state, and this would be the anisotropy of the, of the, uh, of the composite Fermi on Fermi surface. But if I do exactly the same thing, at one third filling, it should have exactly the same anisotropy as well. So therefore, it must be the same anisotropy of the one third laughing state or any uh, fractional quantum Hall states or this model at least. And uh, this uh, has indeed been checked and confirmed uh, by very careful um, numerical, uh, uh, numerical uh, 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 studies uh, also right here, ne next building as well. So partly, I guess, uh, uh, motivated by this, uh, 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 this result, by the way, so uh, Eduardo, would you call this uh, rigorous or <laughs> exact? I think it's exact, but not as rigorous. That's exact, okay, fine. Uh, I wouldn't care if it's, it's, it's <laughs> Oh, okay, well, that's even better. Okay, thank you. But you have to ask other people. This was like the certification. Well, what, what, whatever you think is good enough for me. <laughs> anyway, so partly, um, partly motivated by this, uh, uh, this result, um, uh, Shaden group actually did more quantitative uh, exploration of the relation between the uh, uh, electron anisotropy and the composite fermion anisotropy, this time using, uh, using a string. Okay. So the string controls the electron anisotropy by distorting the, distorting the uh, crystal, and then they turn on the magnetic field to uh, measure the uh, uh, composite fermion from the surface anisotropy, and they found this uh, empirical result, which is the composite fermion anisotropy seems to be very close to exactly the square root of the uh, uh, electron uh, anisotropy. Now, I actually uh, didn't realize that, but they found that if uh, one chooses the uh, range of the Gaussian interaction to be exactly the same as the magnetic lens, all actual, actual factors actually cancel out, and one would actually get exactly this result. Now, the, the problem, of, of, of course, is that uh, this is the lens scale, which is the parameter in the Gaussian theory. But the one of our core interaction, which of course is the uh, actual um, uh, interaction that, that is uh, uh, what, what you have, there is actually no corresponding lens scale. On the other hand, uh, in my original paper, I pointed out that there is actually a effective lens scale for the core interaction in quantum wells because there is a quantum well width. Because the core interaction does soften as you get close to that, that lens scale. So if one were to actually uh, assign a uh, lens, in a particular quantum well, one obvious possibility is to use the, use the quantum well width, which usually is something like 100 to 200 angstrom, which also is uh, also the uh, scale of the magnetic lens uh, at, for example, 10 Tesla. On the other hand, because we are doing things in the lowest lambda level, everything is projected to the lowest lambda level anyway. So basically, there's only one lens scale, which is the magnetic lens. If you explain that equation, that says that alpha is equal to one. If I take it yeah, one, one is isotropy. Yeah, but what, the, what do you mean by alpha equals the square root of alpha? Oh, this, oh, this, this is component oh, Fermi. This, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the, I'm using their, yes. their notation. Yeah, this is component Fermi and this is electron. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, even if you have zero uh, 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 well width and just think about a plane, there is still this uh, uh, magnetic lens, which is basically the minimum distance in some sense the electrons can actually get uh, uh, within each other before foreseeing the uh, spreading due to the lambda level wave function. So in the end, uh, it was found again here that even if you just use the uh, one of our crew interaction, uh, you also get something very close to the same. Okay, so I think it's a, uh, how am I doing time-wise? Okay, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, I hope uh, it's uh, uh, clear or uh, there is enough evidence both theoretically and experimentally that uh, we do have this uh, geometry or geometrical degree of freedom. Um, but what about it's uh, a quantum dynamics? So actually, uh, all the way back to, um, to uh, uh, 1990, Deng Haili and the Shu Chen Zhang pointed out that if you look at the uh, collective mode spectrum of fractional quantum for liquids and push it to the long wavelength limit, you should actually have a, a quadrupolar a mode and this point uh, was also um, made by uh, Eduardo, Steve Kibbelson, Shoaji Sondi uh, when he was here actually, that uh, if you actually consider the possible <coughs> nomadic instability of fractional quantum four liquids, uh, which seems to uh, uh, happen actually uh, in certain systems, uh, you should also have this uh, quadrupolar degree of freedom in the long wavelength limit. But more relevant to what I'm going to discuss uh, 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 later, uh, Duncan and uh, uh, Deng Song and their collaborators have emphasized the point that, well, because these modes carry uh, spin two, uh, they can be called uh, gravitons. And the question is, well, how do you actually excite these gravitons and uh, um, uh, study their properties? Actually, you don't disagree with that. It's, it's also it's a quadrupole. It is, yeah. It's, so it's just it's a, a different. Uh, it's, a, it's a different. It's a quadrupole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether you call it an emetic fluctuation or a graviton is the same. Yeah, I, I'm not just going that. Uh, so, I'm not sure if Duncan wants to comment on that. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. But 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 but. Okay, enough said, I guess. <laughs> but 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 there is one, I guess, new ingredient which I think is. Uh, maybe uh, 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 more obvious if we call them gravitons, which I'm going to get to, which is the chirality. Okay, that's yeah. true. But yeah. the way the pneumatic order parameter couples to the composite term, yes. couples exactly the same as the metric Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. fine, yeah. yeah. But, but anyway, so but, but let's actually uh, put these conceptual uh, uh, issues aside, but just ask experimentally, how uh, would you actually excite this graviton? Well, so, Normally, you would say, well, let's actually try to do uh, use photon. So the problem is that a single photon can not excite this graviton. Uh, there are two different ways to understand this. Why is the mismatch of quantum number? A photon has spin one, but this is a spin two excitation. Another way is to uh, 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 realize that actually, well, if you don't want to think in terms of photon, just think about a uh, classical electromagnetic wave. Then, in the long wavelength limit, all the dipole uh, spectral function, spectral weight, is actually uh, exhausted by the uh, cyclotron mode. So you're not going to actually excite anything that's uh, intra lambda level. So, um, so photon doesn't do it, at least a single photon wouldn't do it. So the natural uh, idea is to use gravitational wave instead of, uh, <laughs> instead of uh, electromagnetic wave which of course is obvious, right? Because we know there's a gravitational wave propagating through the room right now. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's actually not the case when I actually made this crazy proposal, which was in August of 2015, which was a month and a half before the first LIGO signal. <laughs> 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 and not, not surprisingly, uh, my paper got uh, rejected uh, immediately. <laughs> 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 okay. so. So but, but that doesn't prevent me from talking about it now, I guess. So the reason, of course, is that I'm not, I wasn't really thinking about a uh, LIGO uh, gravitational wave, but actually some, some analog of it in condensed matter, and in particular, it's actually acoustic wave. So as I mentioned earlier, one way to actually induce this uh, change of this uh, uh, rank two tensor, this uh, effective mass tensor, which I call the metric tensor, is through strain. Okay, it's a lattice distortion. But an acoustic wave actually 
is made of oscillations of, uh, 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 of the crystal, which actually induces a local um, strain or local uh, oscillation of the, uh, uh, the symmetric tensor. So, um, so there are different ways to do it. If you want to look at the one long wavelength limit, of wavelength limit of zero wave vector for the 2D electron gas, you can think about a acoustic wave that's propagating perpendicular to it. And then you have some frequency that you can tune, but the wave vector is exactly zero. But if you want to actually control both the frequency and wave vector, you can actually adjust the orientation of the uh, acoustic wave. So, well, the algebra is very similar to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, slide on the uh, on the uh, on the uh, exact soluble model. Basically, a uh, oscillating um, uh, uh, crystal induces an oscillating anisotropy in the lambda level form factor. And if you actually expand uh, the small oscillation, you find that this oscillation actually couples to the 2D electron gas in this D wave form. Okay, so that's a straightforward algebra, and uh, I guess it's a, it's a school, so maybe that's, that can be a simple exercise. <laughs> and that means you should only excite uh, spin two excitations in the, in the 2D electron gas. And the acoustic wave, which gives rise to this, will couple to the uh, electron gas in this way, and therefore the absorption intensity uh, of the acoustic wave is a measurement of the spectral function of this couple. It's kind of like the acoustic wave version of the cyclotron resonance. Okay. So, um, so the prediction is that if you have a graviton excitation, it should show up in as a peak in the acoustic wave absorption, which uh, is a internal peak in this uh, spectral function. So actually, uh, when I was fighting my losing battle with PIL, uh, we actually, well, I recruited Abdullahi to calculate this uh, spectral function, and we indeed, uh, we indeed find very pronounced peaks, both for the bosonic one half laughing state and the fermionic uh, one third laughing state. Uh, we didn't publish at the time, but very similar results were first published by uh, John Liu, the last published post postdocs here, along with uh, uh, Romov in a slightly uh, different uh, context. So the reason we didn't uh, rush to publish this other than being lazy is that, well, this spectral function uh, is somewhat like the linearly polarized uh, electromagnetic wave, which does not reveal a very important property, which is the chiroidy. So instead, we focused on a chiral version of these couplings, which are d plus id and d minus id. Uh, couplings, which would actually couple either to spin plus two or minus two excitations. And we instead calculated the spectral function of these chiral versions and found for the laughing state, you only have spectral weight in the minus two channel. But the spectral weight is exactly zero in the plus two channel, which means in the laughing liquid, you only have minus two gravitons, but no plus two gravitons. And I'm going to explain why that's the case. So, um, so these gravitons are therefore chiral. Uh, for core interaction, it's similar. You find that the spectral weight is dominated by minus two. You have a little bit of plus two components, but uh, done by at least an order of uh, magnitude. And these spectral functions can actually be measured not using a single photon process, but a two photon process, because when you have two photons, you can actually couple to a angular moment two excitation. And one of such process is a Raman process. Namely, you have one photon coming in and then another photon going out at different energy. So this was actually done uh, in uh, Aaron Pinsel's group, uh, <coughs> I guess at the time at, uh, at Bell Labs. But unfortunately, they didn't use polarized light they used actually unpolarized light. So therefore, there is no distinction between plus two and minus two. But quantitatively, you find that the energy scale that we found in our numerical calculations actually match what uh, he found um, qualitatively, semi-quantitatively, maybe. Now, a particularly important development afterwards is that Nagoya and Song found that 
actually, the Raman spectral function is exactly the same as the spectral function that we calculated, basically because uh, it's actually a, uh, uh, it's the, it's the uh, stress tensor spectral function. If you neglect the very small anisotropy of the uh, uh, gallium arsenide um, whole band structure, because the Raman process involves a uh, interband uh, transition, if the uh, connection band, which is exactly isotropic, and also is a whole band, then that'll be exactly true, but unfortunately there's a small anisotropy in the whole band, but it's probably uh, negligible. Okay, so, um, well, so I was very excited to learn at uh, uh, this year's March meeting that a, a Columbia and a Nanjing University um, collaboration has now done this uh, circularly polarized Raman scattering where they can actually control the polarization of the incoming light and also detect the polarization of the outgoing light. So you have two incoming possibilities, two outgoing possibilities. So altogether there are four combinations, but only for the combination that you have, let's say left in, let me see, this would be, uh, bottom right. yeah, right in and right out, you see a, uh, you see a, a pronounced peak in the, in the Raman spectrum. But all the other combinations, uh, you don't see any uh, sharp feature. Okay, so, uh, so the speaker of this uh, March meeting talk, Zhu Yu Liu, uh, is the last student of Aaron Pinzuk. Uh, but, but the experiment uh, uh, was done in, uh, in uh, uh, um, uh, Li uh group at uh, Nanjing University. And, uh, Du is a former postdoc of, uh, of, uh, of Aaron Pinzuk. So, so, so all this, these are all descendants of Aaron Pinzuk. Die, if we really want to do this. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, the last time I was actually here before uh, the pandemic, we actually had a meeting. Duncan, Ed, and I had a meeting with, with Aaron to actually precisely urging him to carry out this experiment. And uh, uh, unfortunately, he passed away before this was done. But thank thankfully, uh, his, uh, his uh, former students and postdocs uh, have succeeded in carrying out what he uh, was doing and indeed uh, found that the graviton at one third has uh, has a uh, uh, priority minus two. Okay, so now let me actually explain why it's minus two, but not plus two. Yeah. Can you ask what's the peak in the x equal to zero spectrum? There is no s equal to zero because it's two dimensional. Oh, but what's the peak in the black curve? There is no peak in the black curve. I'm oh, sorry, the black curve. Well, there, there are so many peaks, but, but, but these are two scale. I mean, this, this is much, much more pronounced than, than anything that you see, yeah. So, so to understand the, uh, uh, to understand the uh, uh, minus two chirality, again, we need to actually go back to the, <laughs> the, the, the topological order. The topological order, again, using the stenting pattern is that when you look at a pair of electrons, there is a minimum relative angular momentum, which is three, okay? So all pairs of electrons will have relative angular momentum three, five, et cetera, et cetera, because one, which is the only other possibility, <laughs> consistent with the uh, with, uh, uh, exclu quite excluding principle, or actually more accurately, the uh, anti-symmetry of the wave function is, is forbidden by the, by the laughing dancing pattern or topological order. So a graviton is an excitation that violates this, uh, this topological constraint. So a pictorial way to view this graviton is precisely a pair of electrons with relative angular momentum one. So that costs you energy. That's why graviton is actually gapped. And that actually is a, a, is a, a, a topological uh, uh, constraint violating excitation. And because you have changed the angular momentum from three to one, this changes the minus. Right? Yeah. It does, that's still within neutral number. Yeah, yeah, everything in the neutral number. Exactly, yeah. But this is where electrons. If you actually go to the whole state, let's say two thirds, then you would form a dancing pattern with the holes. 
but the holes have the opposite chirality. So now the locking state will have a minimum in magnitude that is angular momentum minus three, and they have minus five, minus seven, et cetera, et cetera. And there the graviton would actually correspond to excitation with relative angular momentum minus one. So then the prediction is that the graviton chirality will be reversed when you go from one third to two third and the chirality will be plus two. And in the conference in China two months ago, uh, the same group presented data for two thirds. And indeed they found that the uh, chirality is reversed and they saw a peak not <coughs> in the minus two channel, but actually instead in the plus two channel when you go from one third to two thirds. And the paper is under review, which I haven't seen yet. Okay, so, uh, well, I guess, uh, so now let's actually come back to topology and uh, uh, look at the five half state, which may correspond to the more lead dancing pattern or some other dancing patterns that's related to it. So as I mentioned, what the more lead dancing pattern has this uh, exotic three body uh, correlation, okay? But there again, you can actually construct um, you can construct graviton-like excitations with uh, spin minus uh, two as well. Basically, you look at a three-body cluster where you have a minimum allowed total angular momentum, which I, if I remember correctly is five for the Morita state, but then a graviton would correspond to a three-particle cluster that has total angular momentum three. So for the same reason, that would have um, graviton with uh, minus two uh, chirality, but there are also other competing dancing patterns. Uh, the most obvious one is the uh, uh, anti fabian state, which the relation of which is like between one third and two thirds, except here it's at the same half filling. Okay, yeah, I'm almost done actually. Um, well, but if you actually just look at the cooling interaction uh, projected to the, let's say the first excited lambda level, there is exact particle symmetry. So the special function that you calculate will actually be the same for plus two and minus two pattern. Okay. And also uh, there are actually proposals, although uh, no obvious uh, uh, microscopic model to actually uh, stimulate it, the so-called pH Fabian, particle symmetric Fabian uh, topological order, but it has received some uh, experimental um, uh, support, which I'm not going to go into details here. Um, but in reality, you don't have exact particle symmetry because uh, the lambda level projection is never uh, uh, exact because there's always lambda level mixing. And lambda level mixing gives rise to various kinds of effects, <laughs> one of which is to actually give rise to some effective three body interaction, which actually breaks the particle symmetry. So now if you break particle symmetry in the numerical calculation by adding, for example, a small positive three-body interaction, which favors the original more read dancing pattern, then immediately you find that uh, the uh, minus two uh, channel dominates the spectral function. The plus two channel is actually subleading. But in the opposite situation, which seems to be uh, more likely to be uh, uh, the case experimentally, actually the three-body interaction is negative and favors the anti-Fabian. And in that case, you find that the plus two uh, channel dominates the minus two channel, very much like the two-third case versus the one-third case. And uh, this is what we uh, proposed two years ago now that by looking at the uh, um, chirality of the graviton in the uh, at five-half state, uh, you may be able to distinguish between at least uh, these two uh, 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 topological orders. And if you see a, a symmetric uh, 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 situation where you have both plus two and minus two, uh, that might be interpreted as a, a particle symmetric Fabian state. So at the end of the day, you uh, can actually uh, probe or maybe even pin down the topological order by uh, looking at these uh, uh, geometrical excitations. So I guess that maybe I should stop here. <laughs> no, but, but, but I thought that we are supposed to leave 15 minutes for questions. Yeah, we can also, you can finish. Oh, okay, well, I, I only have a 
summary slide yeah. after this. Uh, uh, was there? Yeah. Yeah. I thought you had a question. Yeah. So, uh, do you see this uh, plus minus two uh, uh, mode uh -huh. in a numerical calculation? Well, that, this is numerics, right? And so what I just see is from the spectrum. Uh, oh, oh, well, okay. You know, you know, like, well, so you can. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so the spectrum, of course, is in Duncan's computer. Um, yeah. So, so I think, I think, I think, I think we, we have essentially all the excited states here. These are, of course, only the spin two. Well, of course, you have to get a little bit more careful. We, we do this on a, on, a, on a square. So these are C four, not, not not fully. I mean, okay. Some of the data actually uh, uh, is is actually. Uh, Disk geometry. So these are all the all the all the uh, C four spin two excitations. So 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 yeah, you see that the special weight is concentrated uh, 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 near something. Now this is this is uh, this is at uh, for five cap. But if you look at the log range, I think they're sharper. They're sharper than the than the GMT mode actually. Let's see. So well, okay. So 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 th th this is this. In at these small sizes, this is just a one state which stands out. When you go to bigger sizes, you see a handful of states. Yeah. But well, this thing I was asking is the magnetron spectrum in the previous slide. Yeah. Yeah, magnetron. You can view K as a total number of mentions, say. Mm -hmm. You can view as one of the you, you label this is a total number on the sphere. Yeah, but this is on a, this is on a square. Yeah, I know, but yeah. on the sphere, do you see The, the relative angular momentum. I mean, I, I, I only use picture. So the relative angular momentum going, going from three to one. Yeah. 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 Well, actually, I mean, the, your interpretation, which I the, the quadrupolar field is basically like a, a ferromagnet, except it's uh, SO2, comma, one. And chirality, there are two kinds of quadrupolar fields yeah. positive, definite, or negative, definite ones. And they have magnons like in a ferromagnet, which have a chirality for the Lama precession. But the ones which are positive definite quadrupoles, so a quadrupole is actually not the not what you not most people think about as a, as a quadrupole, it's the variance of charge distribution. Um, and the two kinds of quadrupoles can be positive definite and negative definite, and they have opposite. Chirality. So the guided center quadrupole in electron based quantum hole fluid has this priority, and it's odd on the particle hole transformation, which gives you, if you did it for a two thirds state, it would be lovely if it's the other direction. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, yeah, so uh, I guess, uh, yeah, just uh, to, to summarize for, for this uh, uh, lecture, uh, tomorrow's lecture is actually uh, uh, totally different. Um, so yeah, so some closing remarks for, for this one. So there is actually life beyond topology, um, and the geometry is a is a crucial ingredient, as uh, Duncan emphasized uh, 12 years ago. 
So my response to my colleague is that in addition to uh, coffee and donut, we also have uh, wine and beef, actually. <laughs> we have very good life here. And uh, well, some specific results in particular about the graviton and uh, its chirologies, and uh, as Duncan just uh, uh, mentioned again, uh, well, seem to have been seen, most importantly, experimentally, for one third and two thirds, which are opposite. And this in turn actually tells about, informs about the topology, which can use to actually pin down the, the five half state. And uh, uh, well, I, I hope uh, uh, there is no high energy or astrophysicists in, in the audience. Uh, uh, well, okay, I mean, we, we may actually have a way to actually realize and, uh, and uh, uh, not, not even on the Zoom, uh, to actually study quantum gravity. Uh, you don't have to go across town to go to the institute to do the quantum gravity. You, you can do it in equal actually. Okay, well, that's it. <laughs> sure. Okay, please. Years ago, uh, Lenny Sustin told me, you raised a really good idea to engage fields out of nowhere. Uh -huh. I bet you cannot get gravity out of nowhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well, somebody should tell him that. <laughs> Well, I actually not related to this talk. I actually have a recent paper of realizing black hole uh, uh, event horizon <laughs> by modeling it with the, as a quantum uh, point interface. Uh, yes, actually, it was yeah. a paper that was 20 years ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 I'm sure that's I'm sure that's rigorous. No, no, no. But there is a movie. I'll tell you later. Okay, fine. <laughs> Look forward to that. <laughs> for both plus two and minus two, except plus two is much, much smaller than minus two. However, there also exist fractional quantum or liquids, like uh, uh, two, two sevens, et cetera. Uh, this is a collaboration with a uh, 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 group. Uh, uh, the primary author is uh, uh, Nagoya, in which we showed there are actually from quantum or liquids where you have actually graviton nodes with both chirality. So, so yeah, it's not always just one chirality, but not the other. Um, is that uh, at all is related to, for example, the fact that when I cut uh, the state, uh, for example, the uh, cylinder, then the, um, then the state with the, the V1 pseudo potential interaction will only have one brand of entanglement spectrum uh, rather than entanglement spectrum in the, in the other. Yeah, I'm sure that's related. That's something you want it's to related, about. but it's not the it's not the it's not the low energy uh, C component modes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. They're two separate. Yeah. Things. Yeah. Other questions? Um. So yeah. So something I've been told by my high energy friends is that we can't have immersion gravity pounds because of the weinberg wooden theorem. Yeah. So. I guess my, my well, have I been lied to? Or, <laughs> or should, should your, your no, molded no, gravitons yes, be gravitons and quotation marks? Yes, 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 yes,
So, yeah, so, so what we call ground pound here, well, we really mean people like uh, a lot of so, Well, I mean, I'm just following what you guys have been, have been saying. So it's an analogy uh, that these are spin two excitations. However, there may be, well, I'm sure there is additional uh, criterion those high energy people would actually also apply for something to be uh, uh, classified as a graph. So maybe I can make an analogy to you, which is photons also have spin one, just like vector bosons. But the crucial difference between photon and ordinary vector boson is that photon is a gauge boson. Okay, so there is a, uh, 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 there is a distinction between a gauge theory and an ordinary vector field theory. And they differ by differ by the number of uh, uh, polarizations. The ordinary gauge boson would have, let's say, uh, 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 three polarizations, but photon has only two. Here, uh, the uh, graviton here are excitations of a metric, which in that sense is like what many people would call a uh, 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 sorry, graviton has, is a, is an excitation of a metric, which is the same in the same sense as uh, the high energy people would call in a Gilbert Einstein gravitational theory. However, there is no general uh, 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 epimorphism invariance here. Yeah, so this graviton does it, ex does it satisfy some Einstein equations? No. No, it doesn't. No. Okay. No. And in particular, it's no. normal relativistic. The energy, the dispersion is quadratic in momentum. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Okay, so it's, a, it's not relativistic. Yeah. Okay. So, nevertheless, it is a spin 2 excitation, which is very, very rare. In condensed matter, and we have a, a, an opportunity to study its interaction with some matter field like quality particles. I mean, if you fine tune to the pneumatic quantum spectrum system, it's exactly nothing, but the energy goes very quickly. Yeah, it's, I mean, not, it's not, it doesn't satisfy, it yeah. violates the theory. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering, too, that you're talking about the elementary neutralizations in the bulk. Uh -huh. Is there any way I can, of course, the raw bond is way of probing, but is there anything I can couple to charge? And, and you know, does that have implications for life on the edge? Is there something I could uh, somehow see in, in some sort of conductance measurement? Yeah, so, so actually, uh, I, I didn't mention it. So one advantage of this proposal is that we can completely avoid the edge uh, uh, in probing the, the topological order. Now, how would that show up on the edge? <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't thought system. about it. Yeah. Yeah. Have you thought of other yeah. proposals other than the, uh, the neuron on spectrum? Oh, uh, to, to actually probe this? Yeah, yeah. Well, acoustic wave, except that it doesn't, well, okay. Yeah. So, so in my original uh, proposal, this would not reveal the uh, uh, this would not reveal the uh, uh, chirality. Uh, on the other hand, I think it was um, yeah about a year ago when I gave a talk somewhere. Somebody pointed out to me you might be able to actually use some chiral phonons to to excite uh, these uh, gravitons, which would be sensitive to the chirality. But I haven't given further thoughts to that. Yeah, but but the <coughs> the, the the proposals on the table are. First is this, but better yet, the, the Raman, which people have, well, at least one group has done and seem to have had some success. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a it's going to come on to follow the previous uh, discussion about this uh, working through a graviton. Uh, so actually, uh, as a flagellation metric, you may think in the three plus one dimension, I have a six component, a mm -hmm. five component. And, uh, uh, but the graviton is a very special. It's a, only have a two component and it's a gapless. Right. And uh, so whether there is a condensed matter system such that uh, it's a two component, Gapless mode, spin two mode can converge. Uh, the answer is yes, uh, but there's some design, even in three plus one dimensional large model, this mm. can happen. But indeed, uh, 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 the model is a solid. <coughs> in a solid limit model, the dispersion range is the omega k cube. Mm. 
So it's a somehow it's a void is the Lorentz invariance. I see. And uh, the Lorentz effective theory of this model actually have a name called the Lipschitz gravity. It's a special mm -hmm. kind of gravity, not Einstein gravity, but some right. other right. Lipschitz right. gravity. Right. So mm -hmm. it's a, uh, so it's close, but not quite Einstein gravity. This is like Lipschitz in two dimensions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But here, I think uh, it's not guaranteed to be gapless. No, I'm told. No, no, no. But, but in three plus one dimension, when you have missing mode, this a plus or minus two mode must be gapless. They cannot be under control. Thank you. So, the last question. Yeah, this may be a bit. Uh... Yeah, I'm wondering. I remember you comment on the fact that it's very hard to bring the energy of the of the sphere. It's very hard to bring that energy. But that has nothing to do with the geometry. I mean, that's a, that's a sort of the generic property of the of the spectrum. Okay. So so you you'll see it if you see it in a sphere, you're going to see it on porous as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. But if you have some bilayer on pole and with the graviton with the opposite, yeah. uh, that is possible to bring. Yeah, so I, I know Jolio and the Zlanko Papic have been exploring that and they have uh, publications, uh, so most of them uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Gromov as well. Um, I don't know how, how successful they have been. I mean, so trying to actually bring this mode down, uh, there are some explorations, but I don't think it has been very exhaustive. So I wouldn't be too surprised if people succeed eventually to to bring that down, yeah. Uh, Eduardo, yeah. you have a comment yeah, on there that? Is, okay, look, as you all know, in higher Landau levels, including N equals one, there is a tendency to produce an isotropic states. Yeah, which are yes, so yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And they have this very pronounced and right. right, 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 right. This is what right. leads on to the right. pneumaticity. Right. On the other hand, you also need to maintain the, the, the bulk gap itself because if you play games without the gap itself, okay, yeah, this is when the, okay. yeah. In order, except for seven cells, the only cases I know where you see a clear case for pneumaticity is actually in the compressible regime. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Including yeah. in the first standard level, n equals one. Yeah. When you apply hydrostatic pressure. Yeah. When the the n equals the five half state collapses, you get immediately into this anisotropic right. state. Right. So there is a clear interplay between these two types of phenomena going on in you know above the lower standard level. So right. it's quite possible that whether it's standard level mixing or the width of the length of the of the you know of the electron gas or whatever you want to call it, the effective interactions actually clearly change the Make this possible. Right. So I don't know these other numerics. I mean, the, yeah. the numerics actually took all these other things into account. But yeah, I, I'm not sure. So, so as I mentioned, that these are the authors who have been exploring this quite a quite a bit recently, including mm -hmm. bilayer systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Let's thank speaker again.